Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining the Academic Job Application Review, or AJAR program for graduate students and postdoctoral research researchers. I'm Jeremiah Johnson from NC State, joined by other committee members, Manish Kumar at Texas, Lucia Rodriguez Ferreri at New, uh, New Jersey Institute of Technology, and Nirupam Ach at University of Buffalo. This is a new program being provided by the Student Services Committee of AEESP with a goal of showcasing some of our outstanding graduate students and postdoctoral researchers reflective of the broad diversity across our discipline and to give these individuals some uh, preparatory experience for academic job interviews. Across this full series, there will be 16 graduate students and postdoc presenters. Uh, they will give a research talk like the session we have today uh, as well as conduct mock interviews with a search committee and a senior faculty member. So try to get the full immersive, but still online experience. Uh, today we have two presenters and it is my honor to introduce the first. Dr. Mim Rahimi, who earned his PhD from Penn State, uh, is currently a postdoc at MIT, where he is focusing on thermally regenerative batteries for low grade waste heat conversion. Today we'll be hearing about electrochemistry for climate change mitigation through electrochemical carbon capture. Dr. Rahimi, the floor is yours. Thank you so much for the kind introduction and thank you for inviting me for this seminar. Uh, hello everyone. Today I'm gonna talk about uh, electrochemical processes for climate change mitigation and I'm gonna specifically focus on emerging electrochemical carbon capture. When it comes to climate change, the usual suspect is always carbon dioxide. And if we look at the historical emission of carbon dioxide, we see a significant increase during the past few decades. And obviously, if we don't do anything, it goes up. And this so far caused some serious problems. So in order to have a sustainable future, we have to significantly reduce carbon dioxide emission. And in order to reach this reduction, experts design a portfolio of options, including, for example, going towards renewables, changing the fuels we're using, and also doing carbon capture and storage. Before talking about the technologies that we could do this reduction, I would like to talk about the scale of the reduction. Here we're talking about the gigatons of CO2 uh, reduction every year. But how big is one gigaton? To put this in scale, the annual global production of all of these foods combined together is only one gigaton. So in, for example, 2060, we're talking about 30 gigatons of CO2 emission reduction, which is 30 times the annual global production of potato, tomato, apple, orange, et cetera, et cetera all together. So we're talking about the big, a big scale of carbon dioxide emission reduction. So any technology that could do the job would be very beneficial and critical to develop. Electrochemistry has been around for a few decades to do to impact climate change, specifically through reducing carbon dioxide emission. The very conventional uh, role is basically electrochemical energy storage or batteries, as we know, in which they can impact the renewable wedge of this portfolio. We also can do electrochemical CO2 conversion, which basically takes CO2 and produce value added chemicals, including fuels, which can impact this fuel switching scenario of this portfolio. Both of these electrochemical processes are very hot topics in terms of the research by just looking at the number of investigation during the past few decades. But there are some emerging roles for electrochemistry that impact other wedges of this portfolio, specifically those for energy efficiency and carbon capture and storage. During the time that I was doing my PhD and postdoc, I was involved in developing electrochemical systems for either carbon capture or to, uh, to harvest low grade waste heat as electricity. And I was targeting the energy sector to do this systems on the energy sector, which is the, the, the biggest responsible for CO2 emission. Here, for example, I'm showing a, an example of industrial power plant. For this particular presentation, I'm gonna focus on electrochemical carbon capture to show you how we can adapt some of the known electrochemical systems and design a system for carbon capture that we can eventually remove CO2 from a mixture. Before talking about the technology, I wanna refresh your mind on the electrochemical processes. They are basically rely on electrochemical reaction which are a typical reaction, chemical reaction with additional electron. So that means we can bring renewable sources of electricity to drive this reaction. Electrochemical system designed upon electrochemical reaction have several advantages. For example, 
They rely on renewables and also they are easy to retrofit. They have a modular nature, so it's relatively easy to scale up and also they are plug and play. So the idea is to use electrochemical system as an additional asset for carbon capture and storage next to the already existing technology such as absorption, adsorption and membrane based processes in order to do carbon <coughs> capture from different sources, including air, point and mobile sources. But the key question is how to implement, how to bring these fundamentals to a system design that can selectively remove CO2 from a gas mixture. Recently, we review um, electrochemical carbon capture processes and we categorize them into four groups, depending, depending on the mechanism of capture. So here, the first group is basically electrochemically generating a nucleophilic site. Here, I'm, show, I'm showing a quinone molecule. Upon reduction, we generate a nucleophilic center, which is attractive for carbon dioxide from its co electrophilic carbon center. So as a result of this reduction, we can selectively remove CO2, form a, by, form a carbamate, and then later upon, reduction, upon oxidation, we can regenerate the original molecule and remove CO2. So that's how we selectively remove CO2 from a mixture and generate ideally a pure stream of carbon dioxide. The second group is using taking advantage of pH sensitivity of uh, carbon dioxide hydration. And here we're using a proton coupled electrochemical reaction, basically a typical elect electrochemical reaction with additional proton. And here I'm showing a, for example, a redox active molecule in which upon reduction, we consume proton ions. So the local pH of that, champ that section of the, the reactor goes up so we can absorb CO2 as bicarbonate. And later upon oxidation of that molecule, we can increase the pH desorb CO2 from the other side of the cell. So again, selectively removing CO2, you know, and generating a pure stream of CO2 later. The third electrochemical method is using capacitive adsorption. The idea is we first absorb CO2 through chemical absorption and generate bicarbonate and later send this bicarbonate ions into a, a, a capacitive system. And upon polarization, we can selectively adsorb this molecule on the surface of the anode. The fourth group is basically involving a, a metal chemistry inside an electrochemical framework. Here, for example, I'm using a copper chemistry and involving it in a, <coughs> a CO2 absorbent, which we already absorb in an absorption column in order to eventually regenerate CO2 from one chamber of the electrochemical cell. During the past three years, I was involved in research to develop these two groups of the technology, specifically designing electrochemical processes, rely on these groups in order to have an, elect an electrochemical carbon capture system. In this presentation, I'm going to first focus on this electrochemically mediated amine regeneration, and then focus a little bit on the electrochemical modulation of proton concentration. But the, the main goal here to show you how we can adapt some of the electrochemical reactions and bring it and design a system that can selectively remove CO2. But first talking about electrochemically mediated amine regeneration or EMAR. EMAR is heavily inspired by the conventional thermal based processes. This conventional thermal based processes, we use an amine in the absorption column that can selectively remove CO2 from a mixture and can form a carbamate bond. And here we send that stream into a desorption column, apply heat, break the bond, regenerate the amine, remove CO2 and send this amine back to the absorption column and repeat the cycle. That's how we selectively remove CO2 using an absorbent and later regenerate that absorbent. The conventional technology at this, at this stage uh, are facing some issues, some concern mostly related to high energy requirement of the process, as well as high amine degradation. And to, both of these issues are originated from the nature of the high temperature operation nature of the desorption column. So the idea of EMAR as an electrochemical system is to replace this high, desorp, high temperature desorption by an electrochemical cell, and also using the same absorption column. So here we're basically dealing with the same absorption system, selective removal of CO2 using an amine. But here, instead of applying heat to break the bond and regenerate the amine, 
In the anode side of an electrochemical cell, we electrochemically introduce a metal ion. And that metal ion can form a uh, can form bond with the amine stronger than amine with CO2. So as a result, we have this uh, complex of amine metal and desorption of CO2 from the anode side of the cell. But here, in order to regenerate this amine, we send it to the cathode side of the electrochemical cell in which we do electrodeposition of this metal center on the surface of the cathode and regenerate the amine and send it back to the uh, absorption column. So that's how we replace the high temperature desorption in conventional amine-based thermal processes with an electrochemical cell that can operate at moderate temperatures. So we first spend some time on the design of the best formulation for EMR process, both in terms of the amine and, and the metal. And we figure out uh, having copper as the metal and ethylene diamine or EDA as the amine would be a good combination. And um, here, basically I'm showing the, uh, the, the, the process with copper and ethylene diamine. As I mentioned in the absorber, we have selective removal of carbon dioxide through uh, chemical absorb absorption using ethylene diamine. And later we send it to the anode compartment in which we have electro oxidation of the copper electrode, introducing these copper ions in the solution, which they can bond with ethylene diamine CO2. And as a result, we can desorb CO2 in which we can collect after the anode chamber. And later we send it to the cathode, basically electrochemically depositing that uh, copper center on the surface of the, the cathode. So when we started this project, we, we focused first on the electrochemical cell itself, based on the formulation we were uh, proposing. Uh, we were studying key parameters related to this electrochemical cell. For example, what is the gas evolution and dynamic? What is the electrochemical efficiencies? What are the, the, the possible side reaction based on the chemistry we are proposing? And then we took this information that we gained from this controlled experiment in order to design the actual integrated experiment in which the, the electrochemical desorption unit was connected to the absorber. And based on this uh, process scheme, we actually designed the process flow diagram. And one thing that we, we considered when we were designing the actual integrated the process was the, the, the fact that we need to change the polarity of this electrode. As I mentioned, on the anode, we have oxidation of the electrode. We have corrosion. And if we continue with the process, we, we, we might have a complete depletion of one electrode, which is not good. So one solution to that is after a certain time, we change the polarity and also change the flow direction. So that particular electrode, which was anode, is now cathode. So in, in, by doing that, we can avoid complete depletion of the electrode. So we also consider that in the process flow diagram when we were uh, designing the process. And when we, when we were operating this uh, process scheme, we were interested about the electrochemical cell, what's the behavior of the cell itself in terms of, for example, potential or current behavior. And also we were interested to know about the quality and the quantity of the gas we were desorbing from the anode side. Based on this process um, uh, diagram, we built the actual experiment in which the desorption column was connected to the absorption column and the whole system was automated. So it, it enabled us to operate continuously for relatively long, uh, for relatively long experiments. And by having this uh, experimental setup, we were able to operate for 100 hours of a continuous desorption and a capture of the gas at the same time for uh, different two different temperatures. And we were applying a constant current and switching that polarity that I mentioned in order to avoid the completion of the anode every two hours. And we have some turning off between the, each cycles. And when we, uh, when we finish the experiment, we figure out the, the, the cycles we're getting is very reversible based on the behavior of the, the cell voltage, for example, that we were monitoring. Also, no, no gas was produced when the current, when no current was applied. Here, for example, I'm showing there is no gas production, which correspond to no current situation. So all the gas that we're desorbing is drive by the electrochemical reaction we're introducing in the system. In addition, the gas production was very close to the theoretical value 
based on the current we were putting into the system. And this actually represent 80% of the theoretical value. One of those parameters that we figured out when we were uh, studying the actual electrochemical setup in a controlled experiment media. We also figure out the gas we were producing was 100% carbon dioxide. So the, the quality of the gas was like 100%. So there is no um, vapor or there is no amine inside the gas we were producing. So eventually what we were doing was going from like a 15% CO2 in the, uh, in the beginning of the absorption column, all the way to 100% uh, CO2 that we desorb using electrochemical reactions. So this was just an example of how we integrated a, a metal chemistry inside an electrochemical framework in order to design a system that can selectively capture CO2 and generate a pure stream of CO2. To change the gear a little bit, I wanna talk a little bit about a different mechanism of capture. We know that the CO2 uh, hydration is a pH sensitive process. That means we can absorb CO2 at higher pH as bicarbonate and carbonate, and we can desorb it back by changing the pH going towards the, the lower values. And as I mentioned earlier, this can be done, this modulation can be done through a proton couple redox reaction. So basically we're going forward with this reaction, we can consume some proton, absorb CO2 as bicarbonate, and by going backward, we can desorb CO2. So this is a relatively simple mechanism, but it has some challenges. For example, the absorption kinetic is slow. In, uh, compared to the amine case, for example. But based on this absorption mechanism and this type of electrochemical reaction, several um, electrochemical systems are developed. For example, in this case, I'm showing two of them. One that rely on this quinone molecule, which act as a, the redox active molecule, which upon reduction or oxidation, they involve two moles of proton. So they can modulate this local pHs and absorb and desorb CO2. And also there are some other system, they are more like a bipolar uh, membrane-based system, which they do water electrodialysis. The idea is to generate chambers with high and low pH and they, which they can do absorption and desorption of CO2. But this sort of system, they have some, uh, they're facing some concern right now. For example, in this case, the, the solubility of this molecule, which dictates the capacity of CO2 uh, capture is in aqueous phase is relatively low, as well as the stability, both chemical and electrochemical. And they also have some uh, low, slow um, electrochemical kinetics. Or in this case, they're using, for example, several bipolar as well as ion selective membranes. So the cost, the cost down the road might be an issue. So based on this mechanism, we, we started revisiting uh, this sort of carbon capture and integrating with an electrochemical reaction. So in the previous slide, I show some system that rely on this proton copper reaction, which the redox active species is in the aqueous phase. But we thought about changing uh, towards the, the solid phase. That means we use an electrode that could host proton during this um, redox reaction. And specifically after trying um, several materials, we figure out transition metal oxide could be an option in which they can, through this redox reaction, intercalate or deintercalate proton ions and subsequently change that pH, which can be used for, for CO2 absorption and desorption. And based on this, we knew, that the, uh, we knew about the chemistry around this mechanism of capture. And we, knew, uh, we had some idea about the introduction of proton to this system. But the main goal was how to take these fundamentals all the way to a system that can do the job in terms of both capture and desorption. And we basically followed the same roadmap as the previous system that I showed, going for, through formulation, doing some chemical, electrochemical evaluation, and later doing the experimental investigation. So in, uh, here, I just wanna show you like a very uh, brief introduction about like how we uh, go from fundamentals to the process uh, by showing you First, the, some modeling around the absorption. So it gives us some idea of what's going on in terms of the speciation in the absorption column. And later we actually confirm it with the experimental data. And then later use this knowledge for the actual desorption uh, experiment. For example, if, uh, we were studying how much um, CO2, how much proton we need to introduce in order to desorb a certain amount of CO2. 
considering the buffer capacity of the system. And also at the same time, we were studying the electrochemical behavior of the system. What would be the theoretical electri uh, electrical potential that we need to put into this hypothetical system in order to uh, drive this CO2 out of the solution? And using this knowledge, we were able to estimate the, the energetics needed for uh, these electrochemical processes that we were introducing. And this was very close to the EMAR process that I show and very competitive to other electrochemical as well as conventional processes. Then we use this theoretical framework to formulate the actual experimental setup, going all the way from the very initial electrode preparation to more sort of like an optimal electrode setup in which we could do a continuous desorption of carbon dioxide from a solution. So again, this was just an example of how to use a, a, a mechanism of capture, combine it with an electrochemical reaction in order to desorb CO2. So these two systems that I showed, the proton concentration process and EMAR are just a, an example of um, two of these categories of electrochemical carbon capture, but there are so many other examples from these categories as well as the other categories that are developed at different scales, all the way from formulation at molecular and process level, all the way to lab scale experimental apertures. And these systems are designed for carbon capture from both relatively high concentrations such as industrial flue gas or um, diluted streams such as air through a process known as direct air capture. What could be done next is to go towards pilot scale and beyond. And in order to do that, we can ad adapt some of the expertise that are developed in more conventional carbon capture communities and bring those into electrochemical system in order to go towards pilot scale and beyond. I'm, I'm personally very excited to be a part of this community because I think this is sort of emerging within both electrochemical as well as carbon capture community by just looking at the number of investigation in the past few years, we see a in significant increase in terms of the publication and this is actually going up also um, in 2021. To just put this um, presentation into conclusion, um, I hope I showed you some potential for electrochemical processes that they can be used to design system that can selectively remove CO2 from a mixture that can come from either from atmosphere or from industrial stream. And we can separate CO2, generate pure streams of CO2, which can be used later for either storage or utilization. I think the nature of these processes, which rely on renewable source of electricity, is very attractive because we can connect it to another electrochemical system, which is electrochemical conversion of CO2, and close this whole carbon loop. So basically, the idea is we send this uh, carbon dioxide to this uh, utilization, electrochemical utilization unit, in order to uh, generate value-added chemicals, and later we can capture it again. Uh, I'm sure uh, you'll, you'll hear more detailed information in the next presentation about this particular system. Um, so to just um, uh, at the end of the presentation, I want to acknowledge um, those who helped me uh, to perform the experiment, to supervise the experiment uh, from Penn State, my advisor, Professor Logan and Professor Gorski, um, as well as Professor Hatton from MIT and also the whole group uh, from both university. Um, I also want to acknowledge my other mentors uh, that I was uh, that I had a chance to learn from them in the past uh, almost 10 years, and also the sponsors uh, for my both PhD and uh, postdoc work. And if you want to uh, hear more about these things, or if you want to discuss more, please send me an email. And um, I'm also on Twitter. Uh, if you want to know more about the details of these projects, um, I, you can find some information on my personal website. I also establish a platform on uh, climate change. The, the main goal is to spread awareness about climate change. Uh, I appreciate if you have any feedback or if you wanna contribute content uh, for that uh, particular website, it's uh, climatechange.guide. And uh, thank you so much again for uh, inviting me and I would be happy to take your questions. Very nice, Mim. Do, do we have any questions in the audience? I think we have time for, for a couple. Let, let me get the ball the ball rolling um, so at the end you you um, uh, made the nice case of uh, 
we have opportunities to create CO2 streams from the atmosphere, so 400 parts per million. We have opportunities to create uh, uh, CO2 streams from industrial, uh, uh, industrial flue gas, which would be much higher concentrations. Um, which of the processes that, that uh, you're looking at and considering are, are best matched with, with which introductory um, concentrations? And what, and what is the implication you see for, uh, for how that would scale up? Excellent, excellent question. It depends, I would say it depends of either we wanna go for point source capture or uh, carbon capture, it depends on the sensitivity of the electrochemical system. For example, when we're dealing with um, um, atmospheric carbon capture, we're dealing with the large quantities of oxygen. And some of these electrochemical systems, specifically at the reduced state, they're sensitive towards oxygen. So in that case, th those particular mechanisms wouldn't be suitable. For example, the quinone molecule that comes into my mind. Uh, but some of them, um, for example, dealing with a different temperature. Uh, for example, if we're do doing pre-combustion, which we're dealing with a few hundred degrees C, some of the system are not, uh, not performing well at higher temperature. So the condition of the initial stream would uh, to some extent dictates what scenario we wanna pursue first. And um, in terms of the scaling up, I think one of the key aspect of this uh, system are this, uh, the modular nature of the system. So um, it's relatively easy to scale up and it's relatively easy to retrofit to already existing industrial sites. So that's one of the barriers for the conventional system so that they, they have a big uh, footprint. So it's, it's not easy to integrate to already existed plants. So, but this electrochemical system can be, uh, e it's easier to, to retrofit for this already existing um, industrial as well as the energy sector. That's, that's great, thank you, Bim. Um, Radisev, I saw you had your hand up. Yeah, you still have I a did. question? Okay. I did, and then Manish yelled at me, and so I, still, I lowered my hand. <laughs> 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 no, okay. okay, very nice work, Mim. Uh, I, I really like the comprehensive nature of it. Uh, my question is more general, because it's not my area really, but I was curious, you know, most people work with a pure nitrogen CO2 streams, you know, and at least for the first phase, is the amine absorption process so selective that there's no carryover of other ions that are going to end up in your electrochemical cell? And so I'm not sure if you thought about it and whether the presence of other ions is going to change the operating parameters, the overpotential, everything else you have to adjust in your cell to make it work. For this, the, the EMAR process. And, and so that's like a practical application. And the other one is that, why do you have to run this in a cyclical mode? You know, why do you have to, you know, uh, charge the electrode and then you have this charge? You know, how does that affect the ability to continuously process? Um, or it's so quick that it doesn't really matter. You don't see the, the effect on the regeneration of the amine solution. Excellent. So the, regarding the first question in terms of the, uh, the most of this experiment was done in the presence of nitrogen, oxygen, and um, CO2. But for the particular case of EMAR, which we're dealing with copper ions, SOX, presence of SOX would, could be a problem, could cause some precipitation uh, with uh, copper inside the electrochemical cell. So we have, uh, we've learned a lot from the conventional carbon capture system that they have so, sort of pre-treatment in order to avoid those gases before they hit the, the actual carbon capture system. So um, for that EMAR system, I would say um, the amine itself is very selective towards CO2. So nitrogen is not uh, a concern, but SOX could be a concern. In terms of why we change the polarity is because of the, the nature of the system is that we are dealing with either for the EMAR case, corrosion of the electrode, or for the second scenario that I mentioned, depletion of the electrode from proton ions. So in that means at some point the performance goes down. So we have to switch the polarity in order to regenerate that performance loss. And, but this is just for the electrochemical cell, the way we integrate it into the process the actual process is continuous. So we continuously desorbing CO2 from the mixture, uh, but the electrochemical cell, we're just basically switching the flow direction as well as the polarity of the electron. Thanks, and, and is anybody looking at a techno-economic analysis of this? I mean, is it ready for that stage or it's too early? We've done some techno-economic analysis on uh, the EMAR process, but it's, uh, I would say it's too early for like having a comprehensive uh, 
a number for dollars per tons of CO2 we're removing and comparing that with the state of the art technologies. Great, Th thank you, Mim. I, I think we're gonna have to uh, transition to our, to our next speaker now, but if you could all join me in giving a virtual round of applause to Mim. Uh, great presentation, we, we really appreciate your, your participation. Thank I'm you. gonna hand the microphone over to, uh, to Lucia. Lucia, you're here? Yes. Okay. Yeah, I'm sorry I was late. I had another meeting before and obviously it, it ran over time. Uh, but it's my pleasure to be here and presenting our next speaker, uh, Dr. Joshua Jack. And, and he's going to be talking about uh, uh, rethinking uh, carbon economy through hybrid CO2 valoris valorization. Uh, he's um, in Newark, so he's from across the river from the Bronx. Uh, and he went to pursue his bachelor's and master's in environmental engineering from the University of Massachusetts, Amherst. And then he got his PhD in environmental engineering from UC Boulder. And now he's a postdoctoral researcher at Princeton University. And he's working in looking at hybrid CO2 valorization using biological and electrochemical processes. He has received numerous awards. I was just checking his CV uh, and including these awards, there's an NSF scholarship and a NASA research award. And another thing that I want to mention is that he has been very involved in outreach activity, including in Engineers Without Borders. Uh, and in that work, he was able to, to work with the two communities, I understand with Kenya and Peru. So very exciting, and he's going to be talking now about his research. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you for the introduction. Um, I'm kind of getting an echo there. Oh, good. Uh, well, hello, everyone, and thanks for tuning in. Today, I'm going to be talking about the exciting topic of CO2 valorization, where we essentially try to take carbon dioxide and turn it into fuels and chemicals that we can use every day. Such technologies ultimately turn our current economy into a carbon management tool that we can use to mitigate greenhouse gases and combat climate change. So first, what I'll do is give a quick background on some of the different uh, carbon feedstocks that are available and some of the CO2 valorization technologies that are on the table. Uh, then I'll go into some of the work that I completed at the National Energy Lab while I did my dissertation work at CU Boulder and then get into some of the things I'm currently doing at Princeton University. So to really uh, adequately discuss the carbon economy, we first have to recognize that it's inherently linked to other vital resources in a water energy carbon nexus. So you could see, just for an example, that energy is very much linked to water as nearly one quadrillion BTU of electricity is used to process wastewater. Conversely, you can kind of see that water is used in large amounts to create energy with processes such as hydrofracking, thermoelectric cooling. Again, you can see wastewater can be used to produce um, energy as it has inherent value for doing so. And we can go on and on. Um, today, we're going to be talking about carbon, but I think it's important to kind of keep these synergistic um, relationships uh, in, in mind as we talk about this. And right now, uh, our carbon economy is very much linear, where large amounts of carbon are accumulated in low value forms um, that are not very useful. And so what we'll talk about today is taking some of these low value carbon forms and valorizing them back into useful forms and essentially trying to turn it into a, a circular carbon economy. So the big questions for are, where does carbon accumulate and how can we valorize it? So here's a look at a lot of different uh, cheap and abundant carbon feedstocks I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with. Um, it comes in many different states. Uh, and these are chock full of organics uh, carbon that we can use to uh, valorize. Um, just for an example, uh, for food waste, you can see that we have 14 million dry tons of available per year. And something like animal waste is available about 26 million tons uh, per year. Indeed, many technologies have been developed to target these uh, waste streams and recover nutrients and energy, some of which are very mature, like anaerobic digestion. Um, although some of these technologies can be really effective for uh, degrading the organics, um, some of them can be carbon positive. Uh, for instance, biogas typically con uh, composes about one third of CO2 itself. With this in mind, in growing concerns about the climate, um, we're starting to think about ways to transform carbon positive solutions into carbon neutral and negative. 
and really expanding on some of the work that we've done in the wet waste to also consider some gaseous forms of CO2. Um, these can include uh, biogas that is generated from uh, landfills, as well as industrial sources of CO2, like ethanol fermentations, or uh, cement uh, effluent or flue gas from power plants. And if these are not really adequately managed, they can end up as non-point source CO2 sources in the atmosphere. And I'll actually touch on a little bit about that today. So right now, uh, you can see that carbon dioxide is one of the most carbon uh, yeah, most abundant carbon sources on Earth. Right now, we sit about 410 ppm, which is about 3,200 gigatons of carbon there in the atmosphere. Every year, about 40 billion tons are released into our atmosphere by human activity, leading to about 2 ppm increase per year. And if we look back to where this starts, we can see, kind of see that the increases start around the 1800s, mid 1800s to be exact. Uh, and that was about the time of the Industrial Revolutions, where we started using large amounts of power to electrify our manufacturing and transportation industries. So you know that energy and carbon are inherently linked here. And you can see that right now, a large amount of our um, energy comes from fossil fuels, such as petroleum, natural gas, and coal. And indeed, the energy sector itself is a large emitter of CO2, and mostly coming from solid and liquid fuel burning. Recently, there's been a big push to renewables. And over the last 10 years, there's been substantial decreases in prices. One of the all-stars is actually solar, which has decreased in about 80% over the last 10 years and is reaching a uh, cost of about three cents per kilowatt hour. And this has been due to uh, improved economy of scale, uh, different tax incentives, as well as improvements in uh, capture efficiencies. And this has coincided with great increases in our installed renewable capacity worldwide. So one of the questions becomes, what, how can we leverage the cheap and abundant sources of renewable energy that are on the horizon? And carbon dioxide is in our atmosphere as well as being emitted by various feedstocks. Well, maybe we can engineer these carbon reduction technologies to take CO2 or other carbon sources, combine it with renewable energies, and make intermediate products or, uh, that we can use every day. This is actually a quite different approach than natural photosynthetic processes, which were involved in the first and second generation biofuels, where they use um, basically solar and CO2 and natural photosynthetic process to make biomass that was later degraded. And it turns out that underneath the umbrella of these engineered carbon reduction systems that are currently under extensive review, electrocatalytic and biocatalytic methods seem to be the best. And before I go any further, I'll just also kind of reiterate that the sources of uh, carbon dioxide could also be swapped out with a number of different of the waste streams that I mentioned before, which could be a CO2 source as well as an electron source. And we'll talk about that a bit later. So first I'll discuss electrochemical CO2 reduction. Here I'm talking about an abiotic catalyst uh, that is on or near the surface of an electrode that initiates the uh, reduction of CO2 into many different products into in basically a proton coupled electron reaction. And um, this can be done at very high production rates and efficiencies, especially for large, uh, smaller carbons such as carbon monoxide. And uh, once you start trying to get to the higher carbon numbers, you uh, usually demand higher over potentials and it leads to these complicated reaction schemes that leads to limited selectivity. On the biological side, um, one of the technologies that directly uses uh, renewable energy to reduce CO2 um, is called microbial electrosynthesis. And here we're talking about um, microbes that live on or near the surface of the electrode. They use tracellular electron transfer mechanisms to obtain electrons from an electrode and reduce CO2 as part of their metabolism into uh, different metabolites as well as cells for the growth. And this can be done um, with actually really great product selectivity and efficiencies. Um, and we can make a large uh, portfolio of different products ranging from VFAs to all of this. Um, the, draw the drawbacks of this mainly are that the production rates are uh, very slow um, compared to other technologies due to uh, limited surface area, mass transfer of nutrients that needs to take place at the electrode surface, and the actual electron transfer uh, rates from the electrode to the microbe itself. So how do they compare? Well, with the electrochemical CO2 reduction, you can get pretty high rates, but the selectivity is pretty low for larger carbon numbers. Whereas on the uh, microbial side, you can get high selectivity uh, 
for these larger carbons, but the rates are very low. So noticing this uh, complementary limitations, we developed this biohybrid approach uh, where we decoupled the two processes. And first you have waste CO2 and renewable energy enter a uh, electrochemical CO2 reduction cell, and that can produce electro generated intermediate at high rates. Then that intermediate is fed to a microbial reaction where it is further upgraded into a value added products with larger carbon chains. And so to start the ball on this one, we uh, have two major questions in mind. What electro generated intermediate should we use and what microbes can we effectively couple with this intermediate? So surveying the different uh, electrochemical CO2 intermediates that we could use, carbon monoxide showed to be one of the most promising intermediates uh, because it's biocompatible and can be produced with high efficiencies. Uh, next, the question was, what microbe should we use? Well, we chose to pair carbon monoxide with the acetogen, Clostridium indala, due to its innate ability to actually consume uh, carbon monoxide naturally uh, via the wood yondal pathway. And CO enters here with the form of dehydrogenase and goes to the methyl branch, where then it hits the um, amazing uh, carbon monoxide dehydrogenase to actually fix that into acetyl-CoA, which is then the branch that leads to the production of acetate ethanol. And in the absence of CO, we can actually use hydrogen and CO2 as well in, in the same pathway to make acetate ethanol. So with these two design choices in mind, we then came up with a schematic of a two-stage biohybrid system where CO2 enters an electrocatalytic cell creates syngas, which is a mixture of CO, H2, and CO2, that enters a secondary fermentation and then is consumed by bacteria to make fuels and chemicals. The first step in trying to making this a reality was trying to answer the question, how do we electrochemically produce syngas? Uh, so I worked closely with a chemist in our uh, department uh, in CU Boulder and first investigated these platinum nanoparticles that would be um, impregnated into these covalent organic frameworks. And they actually have very high surface area and um, very, very uh, catalytically active. And we found that they could be used at high rates uh, to produce hydrogen, even in alkaline conditions where protons were limited. Building off this electrochemical knowledge, I then started studying uh, some cobalt porphyrins for doing electrochemical CO2 reduction. And the thought here was that actually by functionalizing the um, molecular structure of these catalysts with um, different protonated groups, we could increase the uh, proton uh, concentration at the local uh, state and actually uh, stabilize some of the adducts and make more carbon monoxide. And with these, we were actually able to do um, get tunable ratios of different um, H2 and CO. So you can kind of see that here with the uh, different efficiencies that we were able to show. So now that I could actually electrochemically produce hydrogen or CO and make different ratios, it was time to try to see how the H2CO ratio could actually um, be integrated with the microbe and how that would affect its metabolism. And doing some studies where I autotrophically grow the acetogen and Clostridium dalii, we found that carbon monoxide was preferred, um, as you can see on the one-to-one -one ratio here of carbon monoxide to uh, hydrogen, the uh, carbon monoxide gets uh, used up a little bit faster. And on the other side, you can see that the use of carbon monoxide actually leads to the production of more reduced products. And this happens to be because more free energy is released or the, likely the reason why. And so with this uh, understanding on the electrochemical side and the biological side, we then move to put it all together and make a biohybrid system. And this, the first step to doing this was actually uh, integrating our catalyst into a flow cell so that we could attain high current densities and support large production of the electrochemical intermediate. And here you can see that CO2 enters from the right in its gaseous form um, to then get reduced into the syngas. And on the left, you can see an analyte which just uses an oxygen evolution reaction to provide the electrons for the, uh, the entire reaction. And with this setup, we are actually able to get some great current densities, about 200 MA per centimeter squared, and produce a carbon monoxide, which is our preferred substrate, at an efficiency of about 80%. With this electrolyzer, we then integrated the bioreactor at the end using a setup like this in our lab. 
And with this biohybrid system, we first tried it under autotrophic conditions with just the CO and then with uh, mixotrophic conditions with fructose and CO. And you can see that under both cases, we got pretty excellent biomass production rates, good tires of ethanol and acetate, and good production rates. But you can also notice that when fructose is added in those mixotrophic conditions, we get far better growth and metabolite production. So we started asking ourselves, how can we boost the system's performance? Well, there's two fundamental things we could do. We could try to increase the gas liquid management transfer in the bioreactor, as we kind of know that COH2 and CO2 are um, not very soluble, or we can try to play around the microbial metabolism. Today, I'll just talk about the engineering approach that we used for um, increasing gas liquid management transfer. So uh, one of the ways we started thinking about this was that we wanted to find a scalable solution that could work with membranes and other different architectures. So uh, we decided to try to use these silica nanoparticles in solution to actually uh, bring some of the CO down into the solution to be uh, uptaken by the bacteria. And these have been found in the past to be biocompatible. Um, and they work in several different ways. Uh, a couple different mechanisms here are, one, uh, the nanoparticles can actually break CO in, uh, to smaller particles or small, smaller bubbles and increase its interfacial surface area, uh, allowing it to be uptaken easier. Secondly, it could be actually drawn into the solution kind of by this shuttling method that here. And third, we can talk, think about um, the increasing of the hydrodynamic flow throughout the reactor. And um, a number of these different mechanisms can actually be accelerated by making these particles hydrophobic, um, especially the gush, gas shuttling uh, aspect of it. And so we tried to uh, functionalize these silicon nanoparticles with methyl groups as well as mercaptor groups. And first pass, we just used these uh, nanoparticles in bottle cultures, and we actually found that the mercaptor groups on the silicon nanoparticles were able to boost our uh, product uh, titers. Then we actually put these nanoparticles in our solution in our bioreactor of our biohybrid system. And we saw great increases in the uh, growth and metabolite titer and production rates. And part of the reason behind this is likely that we found that the microbes enjoy um, living amongst these particles and are actually interacting favorably. It seems like in some cases they might be even uh, making uh, extracellular poly. Uh, substrates to uh, cling to the particles and transport themselves around the bioreactor, or they actually could just be attacking themselves and um, increasing their surface area to uh, obtain more nutrients. So some of our conclusions here was that we were able to uh, make a excellent electrolyzer um, for making CO at high current densities, which is able to provide reducing equivalents to our bioreactor system. In our bioreactor, we have actually got really great rates of um, acetate production and ethanol production. The acetate production itself was about 10 times higher than state of the art CMO2 reduction technologies and um, very much higher than uh, pure culture MES uh, microbial resistance rates that have been shown before. And um, kind of doing a preliminary TEA, we were able to determine that um, the ethanol that we were producing here could be actually uh, give, uh, obtain a spot price of $100 less than uh, the U.S. spot price for ethanol, which is about 800 right now. So now we're kind of building off this platform and trying to say, rethink how we make everything. We're looking at different ways to um, make everything from bioplastic to pharmaceuticals, um, even vehicle fuels. And I'll get back to this idea that, well, we don't just have to use CO2 and renewable electrons, but we can use a number of different waste streams to try to target and upgrade them into these products. And these waste streams themselves can uh, be the carbon and the energy source. So really try to think about ways that we can turn these waste streams to value streams. Um, so I'll just say a quick thanks to my lab group for all their support, um, as well as my collaborators at the National Energy Lab and Department of Energy, uh, my faculty here at Princeton, and thank you coordinators of the ASP uh, for allowing me to uh, give this presentation. So I'll take questions. Um, also, uh, sorry, this is uh, my Twitter handle at the bottom here if you want to uh, follow. Uh, um, yeah. Okay, great. Thank you so much. So now it's time for questions. Uh, please raise your hand if you have a question and unmute yourself. And 
uh, or you can just write the the question in the chat if you want. And let's see. Uh, okay, I will ask a quick question just because I was curious. I saw that uh, when you mentioning you were mentioning uh, improving the efficiency of the process, you talk about uh, increasing the gas liquid uh, mass transfer or improving the microbial uh, metabolism. Uh, have you worked in the microbial part and how would you do yeah. that? Yes, so actually um, I didn't really have time to discuss it here, uh, but uh, our collaborators at NREL and the biosciences department there have been developing some CRISPR methods to actually tune the uh, metabolisms of uh, Coscumian dalii. And we recently uh, put out a paper where we were actually able to make more ethanol. Um, by tweaking two of the um, proteins inside of CD. Right. So, and we're currently working on some other things um, that should come out soon, but yeah. Great, and so you were able to combine both the approaches that you were used to, uh, to improve the, uh, the mass transfer and the microbial uh, activity? Or have so yet. some of the things that we're actually working on right now have to do with that, as well as uh, developing some new reactor architectures. So stay tuned. <laughs> okay, great. Thank you. Other questions from the audience? Um, okay. It was an excellent presentation. So, <laughs> yeah, Lucia, can I just? Uh make an observation, yes. you know, if it's, it's okay, Josh, I think you're, you're, you're doing a great work. And I don't mean to patronize or anything like that. But if you could slow down a little bit, you know, that would be, you know, helpful in sort of focusing and explain you're jumping through slides fairly quickly. And I'm, I was having a hard time looking at the data and you know you, people like to make their own conclusions when you show the data people are like aha uh -huh, i got it you know but you're not giving us that chance because you're flipping through slides fairly uh quickly and again the same uh, uh question that i have for you is is the one that i asked mim and that is um it's it's wonderful to focus on a fundamental science and that is the the you know but I, i've been in this business way too long so that i started to think about you know how do we make an impact in the field and so i would like to encourage all the junior researchers you know the young people who are enthusiastic is to think about the final application and that is you know we always work with a pure solutions or pure systems in our labs and everything works really well but you know try to make your life a little bit miserable by introducing some nasty components that you may see in the real applications and then if you can solve it you know under these conditions that probably would strengthen your belief in in you know the application that you're looking at and so you could answer these questions you know when you go to conferences and so forth so that that that's just my a uh, uh, comment in general, you know, for for younger folks to think about the impact, you know, how, you know, not only in terms of science, you know, and that's great, you know, I think that's what your passion is, and that's fine, but you know, how do we translate some of that to make a difference in in the profession, you know, in, in applications? So, have you thought about, you know, what may be a potential? Uh, a roadblock or potential kink in, in your pathway towards integrating the two processes, uh, any contaminant carryover, you know, any other materials that could affect behavior one or the other system? Yeah, so actually some of the work that we're doing right now is trying to um, use uh, re real kind of carbon waste streams, uh, testing different um, purities. Um, that kind of been discussed before, um, we have a number of different gaseous forms of carbon that are available to us. And something like flue gas is, you know, 10, 20%, where something like ethanol fermentation would be something like 99% CO2. Uh, so we're trying uh, to see how that would integrate with our electrolyzer. And then we're really trying to actually use um, things like uh, wet waste um, to kind of power the system. And that's a, a little bit something uh, those architectures I discussed are under the hat still. We'll be talking about those soon as the publications come out. Uh, but yes, the, the whole goal is to integrate um, real waste streams into these systems. And this was just more of a proof of concept work 
um, before we start doing the scale up. But yeah, my goal is to really valorize all types of different carbons. And so we need to see the real life applications by integrating those waste streams. Good, thank you. We have a question in the chat uh, from Kitan Shah. Do you want to unmute yourself and ask it? If not, I will read it, but we'd rather have you <laughs> interacting with us and get to know you. Okay, um, they're saying, great presentation. How do you think the end application of CO2 removal using electrochemical method at open dams landfills locations? An, so the question is, how would we use a CO2 electrolyzer at a landfill? I think so, yes. Mm -hmm. So um, right now, I guess, as uh, kind of the previous uh, presenter discussed, there are some methods to uh, purify the CO2 streams. And right now, if I'm envisioning how we would do this, um, first, I, like I said, we're trying a lot of different blends of CO2 right now to uh, see how the um, kind of percentage of CO2 affects the electrolyzer performance. So we could do a number of different tests there. Um, and because ultimately we do want to try to avoid some of these capture technologies as they can be costly as well as they can involve uh, expensive chemicals um, or rare chemicals. And so uh, basically we would be upgrading the biogas, but uh, trying to feed that directly to our CO2 electrolyzer and see kind of what the consequences are. Are, are we making products that we don't want or are we making, uh, you know, poisoning our catalysts and other things like that. So. Um, there's a hand up from Sumant. Hi, Sumant. Uh, please unmute yourself, introduce yourself, and ask your question, please. Yeah. Hi. Thanks, Lucia. Uh, my name is Sumant Bawasrala. I'm a postdoc um, at University of Tennessee in Oxford. Uh, so I know you were uh, using a microbial conversion to prepare uh, to produce ethanol. Um, so my question is, uh, are these microbes pure species or are, are you looking at uh, mixed uh, uh, culture of uh, microbes and have you seen better performance with mixed or pure species? So the species that I talked about here were actually a wild type pure culture of Clostridium yandalii. Uh, currently, we're actually looking at some of these uh, mixed consortia to see um, how the uh, performance kind of compares. Um, and again, I uh, also uh, have been doing some work with some mutants um, that have been uh, genetically modified. Uh, and kind of, I can imagine um, that this technology could use maybe a cold culture. So we could have one microbe that will basically reduce the CO2 into acids like acetate ethanol. And then we could have a secondary um, microbe that can use a beta reverse oxidation pathway perhaps to take ethanol and then um, chain elongate that into uh, medium chain um, uh, carbons. So that's that's one way we could think about doing cold cultures or mixed cultures there. Great, thank you. Thank you. One last question, and then we'll move to the networking part of, of today's. Uh, I don't see a name. It's Galaxy S9 Plus. Uh, but please, if you can introduce yourself so we know who you are and uh, ask your question. Uh, thank you. Uh, my, my name is Abdullah. I'm doing a master's degree in environmental engineering in South Korea. But right now I am in Somalia. So thanks to Zoom. Uh, I want to ask you, like, how does this can help developing countries? Do you think we can someone uh, like countries like Somalia can use this to turn into energy? So thank you. I was a little bit late. I want to say I'm sorry. Uh, thank you very much. So I guess the question is, how would we apply these to developing communities, these types of technologies? Um, well, I can guess I can touch upon this, that um, there is a lot of 
uh, carbon being generated in developing communities that is um, basically has nowhere to go and it's not treated. Um, so in the past, I've actually been involved with a study where we looked at using something called a microbial fuel cell that can oxidize organics and waste and then produce electricity out of it. Um, and there's a number of different ways that we can actually use some of the technologies I discussed today to either um, oxidize the waste and then harvest the CO2 and make products out of it. Um, or, you know, we can try to use the uh, waste directly um, and upgrade it, uh, the various components into products. Thank you. I think that Mim can also answer this question because it's also related to uh, to his work, and we can then transition into the uh, the networking and more informal questions, if you wish. Sure. Uh, I would say it's a matter of cost. If we can lower the cost of this carbon capture processes, and also making value-added chemicals that could have some benefits for that economy. That would be very attractive, especially for like uh, developing countries that are producing significant amount of CO2 because of the infrastructure of the energy. So um, it's a matter of cost and also some support from international sector as well could also push this. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you for everyone that came today from many different countries. I can see I'm, I'm very happy to hear that. Uh, thank you, the speakers. Uh, very excellent presentations. And now we are open with